Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am going to be presenting uh, the Journal Club this time. And uh, this is actually a presentation that is a mix of uh, a presentation that I did in my master's thesis and one that I did in Data Makers Fest that I linked here. Um, but I tried to adapt it a bit more to be uh, more tailored to the journal club. Uh, and by doing so, the idea is that I want to give you at the end some tools that you can look for and resources that you can have uh, in order to try and implement some strategy that can be similar to what I did for your particular app applications. So uh, I'm going to start by going a bit of the structure of this uh, presentation. Uh, this is going to be, uh, this is going to start a bit with a story, the story of the experimental use case, where I'm going to try and tell you the motivation of why this work was done. Uh, and then we're going to cover each uh, part that uh, I have performed, uh, either both global and local uh, quantification of the error, sensitivity analysis, adversarial robustness. And this is the part that I talked about trying to give you some tools that you can actually bring home. So let's start with the story. Uh, this was a use case that was uh, implemented in an actual company uh, that deals with uh, telecommunication services. And the idea is that the company has a lot of different customers and a lot of different uh, operators to answer a specific call that a customer might do to a retention line. Uh, here, to give uh, an example of what uh, this is all about, when a customer of this particular uh, company is nearing the end of its contracted period, they might call to this particular company in order to extend their contract. And when they call to this specific company, one of the possible operators that the company has employed might answer this call and might try and resolve uh, the issue of extending the period that this client has been uh, on the company. And now we have a lot of different customers with a lot of different profiles. There are customers that have uh, higher paying packages, premium channels, uh, a lot of different needs and a lot of different uh, needs in terms of number of cards that they're using for voice mo and mobile applications. And we have different assistants that are uh, used to getting calls of a specific type. Uh, we have information both on the volume of calls that these operators have gathered um, in each of the products that the company sells. And we have information regarding the customer that is calling. And the idea is that we want to create a smart system that is able that for each particular uh, customer to create a tailored list of the best operators to answer this particular call. And in practice, the smart pairing problem is implemented via one regression task and then an inference task. On the regression task, we pretty much have a lot of different uh, customer characteristics. Uh, for example, the types of uh, packages that the, the customer has. And we have a lot of the characteristics on the operator side regarding the volumes for each particular uh, type of product that the company sells. We then, given a match of a, copper, uh, a customer and assistant, we try to predict the contracted revenue after the call. And the idea is that when we have specific customer calling us, for example, customer one, we can then cross join with all of the operator av available uh, when we train this machine learning model to try and uh, find the predicted values. And then we get a bunch of predictions that we can then sort from highest to lowest. Now, this is just a textbook industry application. So where does responsible AI come in? Uh, in industry applications, responsible AI is usually uh, in the part of risk assessment. The company wants to know how risky it is to deploy this machine learning model into production and having the decisions being automated by them. But in practice, when we actually look over the risk requirements that they actually uh, enforce on the teams, they're very, very wrong. And they're, they can be summarized in something like this. Please justify the type of machine learning approach that you're using in the specific product. Now, since this is a very, very broad uh, question, it can be answered also very broadly. And I could answer this particular question by saying, well, we use the state of the art approach and it has shown good results in this and this and this task. So that's why we're using this particular model and we can kind of circumvent the idea of uh, employing any responsible AI uh, methods into the 
justification of what model we're actually using. So the first thing that we did in this particular work was trying to take these risk requirements and enhance them in order to actually be able to have some sort of requirements that teams can follow uh, for uh, verifying if a model is actually fit to production, not only based on a very broad question, but in more specific, uh, in more specific risk requirements. So the first idea was that we wanted to go through the idea of Cynthia Ruder, which exposed that in industry applications where there's a lot of risk, where we're dealing with customer data, where we're dealing with operator data, and we're actually affecting their everyday lives, that we should try to first prioritize using interpretable models rather than using a black box model and trying to perform a postdoc approximation afterwards, which is what this definition of explainable AI, uh, explainable ML via Cynthia Rubin, it actually falls on. So interpretable models are able to produce their explanations without using an external approximation, while we have to rely on these postdoc methods for the explainable ones. So, here, we wanted to take a bunch of interpretable models and a state-of-the-art black box model and try to compare in different areas uh, whether they are the correct fit for this particular problem. So what are the areas that we're going to be covering? First of all, uh, we're going to be looking at just traditional performance. We're going to see if by increasing model complexity, either by using more complex, even interpretable models, or using, for example, an explainable model, we can actually have a gain in terms of predicted performance on our regression task. We then are going to look over local uh, disparities in the error and trying to see if there are models that have a higher uh, tendency of creating uh, regions in the feature space where the error is abnormally high or abnormally low. And we're going to see uh, if each one of our approaches uh, maps that uh, error differently locally. We then want to understand how susceptible the models that we are training are to some sort of perturbation. Here we're actually looking at the numerical stability of the decision function that we're looking. The idea is that we want to create a model that if we change slightly some little tweaks in the features, we get some sort of similar response without having the prediction just shoot over to an abnormal amount. We also want to check some, somehow quantitatively whether the explanations that we get using black box models are in fact worse than the explanations that we get using internal models. So the first thing that we did was devise this uh, nice little plan where we chose a family of interpretable models to compare that we're going to, to train our regressor test. And then we had this uh, explainable approach as XG boost. And we're going to go through each one of these individual tests that I covered. And at the end, instead of just having the total global performance, we're going to have a lot of different metrics that allows us to justify the model selection. So let's go to the local and global performance. And before delving into the results, I would also like to explain a bit the models that we actually used. So we chose a family of interpretable models that kind of expand on uh, linear additive models. So the main idea of these interpretable models is that we can decompose the effects of each individual feature in the decision function. Uh, while in, when we have more complex decision functions, we can't really have that uh, advantage of knowing exactly the impact of each individual predictor in our uh, response. So we start with a linear regression where we map uh, our target variable with a linear combination of our attributes. We then expand to GLEM where we add uh, the link function as being a way to map our, uh, our linear result into a different space for the predictions. We then relax the idea that the response of each predictor with our target variable has to be linear. Uh, and we instead accept functions of more general types. Here we stop considering just uh, a linear contribution, but we can, we can have actually a non-monotonic function of some sort. And the way that GAMs are usually fitted is by using a different num number of spline functions, which are basis functions, and creating the map of each predictor to the target variable. And then we can 
add the entire contributions for a particular example and get our production. EBM is uh, somewhat uh, similar to GAM. In fact, it was first presented in a paper where it was an extension to the GAM model. Uh, and the idea is that we have the exact same uh, base uh, as the GAM model, where we have uh, a sum of different uh, functions for each individual predictor, but then we start adding the most relevant pairwise interactions of our features. So we have this term over here. Uh, XGBoost model doesn't have a, a nice model form like the ones that we had before. And instead, if we had to visualize the effects of each predictor in our target variable, we would have to do some approximation with, for example, a nail plot. When we actually go through the performance of each one of these methods, we find that in this particular application, the interpretable me methods lacked it a bit in the sense that we have a, a decrease of 5% of the mean squared error and a 9% of the mean absolute error when compared with our base, uh, our best performing interpretable approach. Now, if this was the end of the extent of our uh, responsible AI panorama, we would just say, well, we tried the interpretable approaches and they're not as good. So we're taking the black box approach as the model that's going to production. But can we actually quantify if we gain something in other dimensions when we are using an interpretable model. So the second thing we did after assessing the error in a global fashion was assessing the error in a local uh, fashion. There is actually an old method of assessing the error uh, in a, a local sense, or at least the residuals, where we take the residuals of our predictions and we take each feature that we have individually and we plot the feature and the residuals and we try to see whether they're consistent with the idea of random noise and there are not any patterns still remaining in our residuals. Residual modeling kind of expands this when we have a problem with high dimensionality data sets where we can't really do this uh, individual. So what we do is that we take the uh, model predictions for each uh, sample for each individual data point in our test set. We compute the absolute residuals and we train some sort of uh, interpretable model so we can actually visualize and understand the, uh, the areas of different error. Here, for example, we train some shallow residual trees. Uh, and at the end, we are trying to find some patterns that are still remaining, some areas where we have an abnormally high amount of error. Now, this can, in fact, be uh, something that contributes to a comparison between our models, where we can see uh, if one model has more error than the other, but it has another benefit. And the benefit is that you can actually inspect why the error occurs. Here, by doing this, these rigid residual trees for each one of the models, we're actually able to understand that customers with higher paying packages and operators with a high number of volume calls were actually being, in the generality of uh, our, all our models, being uh, wrongfully um, predicted. So there was more error for those specific groups. And we can then use this information to try and expand our predictors into conformal predictors, where instead of having point predictors, we have prediction intervals and try to mitigate the disparity of this error, which was actually something that was done. But I uh, think that that's not really the thing that you're most excited probably about this work. So I removed it here and I'm going to the part where you might actually find more value, which is a part of sensitivity analysis. Now, sensitivity analysis is the idea of where we try to see how much the output of a system is impacted by its predictors. This is actually something that's used even in uh, machine uh, visual systems, where we use some sort of saliency methods to actually try and add, get some pixel attribution of the contribution of each pixel to the prediction that we're actually obtaining. And it's also used in tabular methods. And here, I have two methods that we use during this work, the Morris method and the Schaap method, that I'm going to briefly go over uh, and give some understanding to what they actually do. So the idea of the Morris method is that we take our feature space and we place a grid on it. We produce a lot of grid jumps that we can do for each particular feature by a small delta k, and we get uh, by assessing the 
uh, value of a prediction. When we increase the predictor by a small uh, amount, we can get a metric that relates to the slope of increasing uh, a specific predictor by a slight bit, and we get a sense of how uh, susceptible to um, changes in this particular feature a prediction actually is. So we do this sort of um, calculation for a lot of points in our grid, and we can then extract some uh, metrics related to the statistical uh, quantities uh, related with a sample of uh, elementary effects that we got. And the idea is that we can take the absolute uh, value of each of our elementary effects. And this will be a metric of how important the feature is. And then we can take the dispersion of these elementary effects as a way of understanding how susceptible to change in the point where the elementary effect is taken the model is. For example, if we have a highly non-monotonic function, then if we take the elementary effect in an ascending region, we get a very high uh, elementary effect. If we take an descending region, we get a very low elementary effect. Uh, and if we take a large ensemble of these elementary effects and we have a large uh, standard deviation of these uh, values, then we know that this feature is either highly non-monotonic or we know that this feature is highly interactive with other features of the uh, machine learning problem. SHAP is also a, an interesting method. It allows us to understand the effect of each feature by treating the machine learning problem as kind of a game. This is based on the idea of a cooperative game where we're trying to give a specific value uh, for each of the players of our game in order to get a specific outcome. So if we think of our features as uh, specific players, let's imagine that we have four features. We then can imagine uh, the possible uh, combinations of these features being active or being non-active. Being active meaning that we are considering the true value of a certain observation for that particular feature, and non-active meaning that we have to guess. If we have a magical function f that can assess the value of each one of these uh, particular groups, we can then go over the groups where a feature is added and understand the effect of the value of, of the game uh, when we have this feature versus when we didn't have this feature. Here, I think it's good to give, to give a bit of an example. Imagine that we have feature red that we are taking the true uh, value as known. We want to we wanna calculate the impact of this feature red in our prediction. And then we take, for example, a coalition like S2 that doesn't have feature red. We add feature red, we measure the difference in these values attributed to the both coalitions, and we do this for every coalition where we can add the true value of feature F. And we average uh, over the number of ways that we can create the coalition of all players, having feature red being inserted at the position where we're inserting it right now. So the idea is that we get the marginal contribution of this particular feature in all possible coalitions that can be added where the value of this feature is not known. So in order to actually translate the this to a machine learning problem, we need to have this magic function f being uh, something that we can actually uh, use for the inference. So the idea is that we, if we have a coalition, let's say s, which is S2, but as the red player and the orange player, this being the red feature and the orange feature, then we're gonna fix the value of X red and X orange to the true values. And then we're gonna average the response of a machine learning model G over the value variables that we do not yet have as defined in our coalition. And we're gonna see the effect of this function uh, when compared with just a random guess of our model. This is pretty much how the, how the Shapley values are done. This is done for each particular observation. And then we get an average value of the, of the Shapley values for each particular feature, sample over a, uh, a different uh, sample of test points. And we get the uh, absolute uh, average uh, contribution of each feature in our game. The sensitivity analysis by Morris method actually allows for something quite cool, which is 
since we have the dispersion of the elementary effects and the average effect of uh, each of these elementary effects, we can actually plot them in a statistical graph like this. And we kind of define some regions where uh, having, for example, high standard deviation of the elementary effects will mean that we have a high fluctuation of uh, it being in a specific grid point and jumping to the next being very high in some point and being very low in some point. And so we have a function that is, as I said before, either highly non-monotonic or we have a function that is highly interactive with other terms because, again, the grid jumps are not fixed at uh, the other levels for the other features. We can have a grid jump in uh, value x1 for feature 1 and value x star 1 for feature 1. And then we have a different grid jump going from uh, uh, a specific point to the other. So at the end, we get something like this, uh, where each one of our specific features that we have in our model can be placed in this plot. And we can understand whether they're non-monotonic, whether they're linear. And we can infer whether the most important, important variables in our model are actually being used in a way that's simpler to understand, meaning that we have high linearity and we actually can decompose highly independence of features. And we can actually decompose this value um, quite well, or the decision process is much more harder to understand. Uh, when we do this for all specific models that we train, we get something like this, where we can see uh, each the proportion of each feature in these groups for each of the models that we train. Here, the GLEM is a bit of an abnormality, you might think, because it's somewhat of a simpler model. But the idea is that we added a logarithmic link function as the link function of this GLEM, which actually makes the relationships of our variables multiplicative, multiplicative which means that uh, although they might be monotonic, they're highly interactive with other features, and so they all end up in this particular group. But in general, we get some sort of uh, a measure of how simple the decision of our models are, where we can see like the proportion on each of these individual groups. But when we actually do the sensitivity analysis using the Morris method and using the uh, SHAP method, we get something like this. This is the thing that I really want to highlight. There's a level of discord uh, regarding the type of method that we use. For example, uh, here we can see that for this particular model, uh, the explanations of feature importance say that this particular variable is very important in the prediction of the model, and the uh, feature importance via SHAP say that it's rather not important. So when we have disagreeing explanations, which one do we trust? Do we take like some sort of average of the two? That doesn't seem like a correct uh, scientific way of approaching this. So we have to have some way of quantifying how good the explanation is. Quantifying how good an explanation is can be done in three different ways. It can be done in an application grounded evaluation, human grounded evaluation, or functionally grounded evaluation. Now, uh, application grounded and human grounded evaluations are somehow similar uh, in the sense that they relate a lot with the human experience when presented with an, uh, a specific uh, explanation. For example, if I give an explanation to a human and that human is able to reproduce the decision process of the model, um, we can take a sample group of people, give them an explanation, see how well they can reproduce the decisions and have some sort of metric regarding to how good the, how good the explanations are uh, in seeing how close the, people, the people's guess of the uh, predicted value is when compared to the actual value of the model. And that's more centered on the human side. The difference between these two is that human grounded evaluations are uh, using control groups and not actually end users. Application grounded evaluations are actually using the end product, the end product users of a specific machine learning task. Here we focus more on the less costly one of these methods, which are functionally grounded evaluations. And functionally grounded evaluations are a way of measuring some specific mathematical property of an explanation um, rather than trying to see if humans can reproduce the decision by the explanation given them. So here we use uh, one of the metrics that's proposed in this paper, which is called the monotonicity of feature importance, and which I'm going to try to give the intuition to. The idea is that we are trying to see whether 
an increase of variable importance or feature importance translates with an increase of variability of predictions had we had to guess the true value of that specific feature rather than having it. So here, it's useful to think of two edge case scenarios to build intuition on what this metric is actually telling us. Imagine that we have a model, and via some uh, method of extracting feature importance, it says that feature one has an importance of zero. Well, then, if I take the, the true value of that specific feature for an observation, and I change it for another value of its domain, the prediction should remain unchanged, because this feature is not very important in this decision of the model. On the other hand, if I have a variable that is highly important in our model, then we can have, uh, when we take a specific uh, data point and we change the true value of a specific predictor, uh, for another value of its domain, we should ex expect a large fluctuation in terms of the, uh, the prediction that is actually being yielded. So that's the base intuition of this metric for evaluating the quality of feature explanations. Uh, it involves calculating this integral, which is the loss over the true prediction uh, of the model, which is this uh, y star, by predicting the model by changing a specific variable one at a time. And we're averaging the loss over all possible val values of this variable. Um, and here, there are a couple of considerations that we have to take into account. Uh, namely, we don't typically in real-world applications possess the, the probability distribution of a specific variable, so we can uh, try to approximate it somehow via current density estimation, and we can perform this numerical, uh, this integral via any numerical method that we want. And at the end, we get this metric here that we can then compare with the importance of each feature that we pass through here. And we have some graph like this. And the degree of monotonicity of this graph will tell us whether the explanation is compliant with our uh, functionally grounded evaluation or not. And we can infer the degree of monotonicity of this particular uh, graph using the spearman rank correlation. And when we do this, we realize that uh, the best performing uh, export, first we notice one thing, this is that uh, the two explanation methods are actually uh, performing differently uh, according to this metric. So if we had to choose uh, whether we're going to trust the SHAP uh, attributions or the Morris attributions, we can actually take the values that are being given by the feature importance monotonicity and take uh, the best performing one as the, feature, as the explanation that we're actually going to trust. Secondly, we, 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 uh, we see that uh, interpretable models typically have an higher uh, amount of feature importance monotonicity when compared with the Shishi Boost model. Uh, so if we wanted to pick a model just based on how good the explanations are according to this property, we would just be picking something like the GAN model here. The last thing that uh, I did in my work was uh, checking adversarial robustness, which is something that's actually quite used a lot in uh, in uh, the field of visual computing as well, where we have some sort of input, like for example, an image, and we have a small perturbation to this image, and we create a new adversarial example, which is very similar to the initial one, but when we evaluate both of these images by the model that we train, we get a disparate uh, prediction. These uh, adversarial perturbations can be found uh, via uh, an optimization problem, where we try to maximize the degree of discordance between the prediction of a specific image and the adversarial example that it's being generated. And so we can kind of translate this idea of creating adversarial examples to our uh, regression task by sampling a lot of different starting points. We define some sort of perturbation radius the budget that we're allowing each uh, adversarial example to uh, uh, deviate from the actual sample point. And we then try and find the point that maximizes the loss between the predicted value of the uh, specific starting point and the adversarial point. And at the end, we're left with two groups, the groups of starting points and the groups of adversarial points that we extracted. And we can try and see the disparity of 
uh, of prediction quality in both of the groups and try to see how sensitive the model is or how stable the decision of, the, of, of our model is when we're, when we're pretty much assuming that we can have this small perturbation of the inputs that we're giving. And what we get is that typically when we increase the complexity of our model, there is an increase on the uh, ratio between the adversarial error and the true error, meaning that our decision function also gets uh, more numerically unstable around the points that we sample. Here we have also uh, a point that is a bit this part, but this is actually due to the way that we performed this evaluation. Because the GAM function was rather slow in its inference time, we had to use a smaller number of starting points, and that might uh, affect a lot the comparison between the GAM function and the rest of the functions. Uh, and also, we used a relatively low number of splines uh, to fit the, the GAM model, which might mean that we can have a situation where our GAM model is actually a bit underfitted and the adversarial points are kind of exploiting the underfitness of this um, particular model. Uh, and at the end, we would get something like this, where rather than just having the global performance for each one of the metric of the models as our only metric of selecting which model we're going to put into production, we have something like this where we expand the just a model performance by adding some uh, responsible AI metrics into this. And namely, another thing that we could bring is metrics regarding fairness, where we could verify uh, if there are more disparity on the quality of predictions when we use, for example, the gender, the gender of a specific uh, operator as also a feature. But that was actually not implemented because it would uh, imply uh, an extraction of, of data that would be uh, much too costly for this work. But the real thing that I actually think that you can take from this talk uh, is this last slide that I created, which is the tools that you can actually take home. Uh, this is a small mental map that I created that uh, I thought to myself, well, if I was starting my master's today, what kind of resources would I like to have to reproduce this sort of work or to explore a particular subfield on this uh, work performed? And here I just gave a small number of either papers for you to analyze on your own free time if you're interested in this topic or some already implemented tools that you can use for each one of these particular uh, tasks on assessing the quality of your machine learning model. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs>